For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to the Gist on Strategies Global. I am Surya Gangadharan. India's notice to Pakistan on the Indus Waters Treaty seeking modification of the treaty uh, has again underscored the issues over the six decade old agreement on sharing of river waters. Uh, what exactly does this notice amount to? Where is it going to lead? Uh, could it lead to abrogation of the treaty? Again, what does that actually mean? And does it really uh, alter the facts on the ground? Uh, I have with me uh, Uttam Kumar Sinha, a senior fellow with the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. He's a specialist on transboundary river issues and uh, recently wrote a book on the Indus Basin uh, called Indus Basin Interrupted. Um, uh, Uttam Sinha, glad to have you. Thank you, Sudhya. Pleasure. Uttam, we are, um, India has issued this notice to Pakistan. So what happens now? What does this mean? Exactly what happens? Well, uh, the notice, uh, rather surprisingly, is uh, something that we've never seen in the history of the Indus Waters Treaty. It's for the first time that really India has taken a, a very strong position issuing a notice to Pakistan and it described it as being intransigence on implementing the treaty. And we have seen over the last two decades in particular, especially over the various water projects in, in Kashmir, uh, that uh, you know these projects have been debated and discussed, but at a level which is uh, sort of rational and practical to do so uh, within the treaty. Uh, but over the years, especially in the last four to five years on, on the new projects that are coming up, the Kisanganda and the Rakhle, I think um, Pakistan has shot itself on its foot by not abiding with the structures of the settlement uh, that is incorporated in the treaty, the dispute settlement mechanism, and uh, you know, has straight away taken it to the International Court of Justice. So it means two things here. Uh, for India, uh, the projects uh, which it is uh, building uh, on the western rivers is an issue of technicality uh, in terms of designs, in terms of structures, in terms of bondage, etc. Uh, for Pakistan, uh, I think it is politically sort of sending uh, sort of a message that it is not technical, but it is a legal issue. And therefore, it takes it to the International Court of Arbitration. Uh, and I think it's interesting and I think it's important for people actually uh, to understand this whole Article 9 of the Indus Waters Treaty, which looks into the settlement of differences and disputes under the treaty. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are specifics in the Article 9, which talks about negotiations on various aspects. Um, but I think what worries Pakistan is that uh, the government has suggested uh, within the notice uh, is that it will also uh, discuss various issues on the working of the treaty itself and take the experiences of the last uh, six decades and more to see what all the changes that can come about, especially on the designs and, and the constructions of, of the water development projects in Jammu and Kashmir. And I think this, this argument of India uh, uh, is very strong and I think uh, it serves a certain purpose uh, that you cannot have two separate processes to resolve uh, the differences over two specific projects, uh, the Kisanganga and the Rakhle. And, and I think it rightfully, uh, again within the treaty, uh, it is doing all within the treaty and it rightfully therefore considers it as a material breach of the treaty. Um, I must add here that uh, the dispute and difference resolution mechanism is a very um, well-crafted mechanism. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why the treaty has functioned uh, and performed in the last uh, uh, six decades. Uh, and I think there are questions that are to be addressed bilaterally. So it makes a very bilateral case for issues to be resolved. Of course, there are technical issues which can be discussed uh, by the technical expert, which is called the neutral expert, especially when there is differences. And uh, if it becomes a dispute, 
then it goes to uh, the International Court of Justice. So I think the structure is very important. The structure is very important to abide with. And I think Pakistan uh, of late in particular has not really abided by it. So um, to answer the question of whether Pakistan agrees to this or not, this notice or it just dismisses it, I think it certainly has put uh, Pakistan in a bind. Uh, and as we speak, uh, the Court of Arbitration is holding its first hearing in The Hague on Pakistan's objections to the two projects. Um, and of course, India is not participating. And I would believe that uh, good sense will prevail within the Pakistani establishment, which has over the years largely securitized and politicized the treaty. And, uh, and hopefully they will come to the discussion table. If not, then I think it gives India a fair ground to carry on with the hydro projects in Kashmir, irrespective of the neutral expert or the ICJ judgment, or even at a later stage, it can suspend the treaty. So Pakistan has much to lose in terms, not in terms of the flow of the water, which the treaty has favorably awarded to Pakistan, but it will lose certainly the narrative of India as an aggressor and, and the water hegemony. So let's leave Pakistan aside for the for the moment. Let's look at the role of the World Bank, which has helped bring about this treaty so many decades ago. Mm. Has the World Bank been, um, in your sense, how do you read the role of the World Bank so far? Has it been uh, a neutral player in this? Has it uh, tended to side with Pakistan? I and mean, what is the what is your assessment? Well, I think the World Bank role is, is important because they were very much part of uh, the formation of the treaty. Uh, they were the third party legally. Uh, the good offices of the World Bank uh, was used in the 50s to yeah. see uh, the Indus Waters Treaty come alive. But I think their role, uh, particularly in recent time, uh, needs to be looked at uh, with a degree of skepticism. Uh, I'm not going to dismiss the role offhand. Uh, I think uh, what needs to be emphasized to the World Bank, which uh, India can in particular do uh, as uh, an upper Iberian uh, in the Indus Waters Basin, uh, it, it should emphasize itself to facilitate uh, the whole exercise and not to become really a, a political mediator, which it started doing uh, of late. Uh, and some of his role in recent time is quite surprising. I mean, it's not the role that generally the World Bank plays. And I would think that the World Bank role gradually uh, should be mitigated and be more as, uh, as a consultant to the process of water development uh, rather than playing a bigger uh, and greater role. I think its role in the past uh, had its meaning, but uh, the contemporary role, uh, I think apart from helping to appoint the neutral experts or the chair to the International Court of Justice, I believe uh, that the World Bank uh, uh, role should now be uh, sort of scrutinized. Uh, I think also that uh, the World Bank uh, tends to be uh, carried away by the lower riparian, especially Pakistan, mm -hmm. and sort yeah. of put all the responsibilities on the upper riparian. I think it can act as a very effective communicator uh, to Pakistan and, and make them see sense on the fact that there are also lower riparian responsibilities. So I think the World Bank could be used um, as a channel of communication with Pakistan uh, better than what it has done uh, of late. Mm -hmm. So let's get to Pakistan. You've said we can suspend the treaty. We have sought a modification of the treaty. Now you have both hands to clap. Suppose the Pakistanis say we're OK with the treaty as it is. Where do we go from here? Well, it's a tricky question, I think. Uh, I think India would seek modification. I think the notice clearly uh, sends a message that uh, uh, India is just not going to be sitting back and, and just allowing the treaty to function as it has because there has been material breach. There has been a lot of cost incurred of in, on India because of the delayment on the Western project. So I think they will insist on the modification of the treaty. Uh, and this is far away from saying abrogation of the treaty. Remember, the treaty has no exit clause. Uh, in yeah. other words, uh, there is no provision for abrogation. 
But however, um, uh, you know, even in the article 10, I think, of the Indus Waters, it, it does mention modification of the provisions, but by another duly ratified treaty concluded for that purpose. And therefore, you will notice that the notice carries uh, the message that Pakistan should come back to negotiating with India. But that's how you work uh, the modification aspect. You cannot do it unilaterally. Um, of course, Pakistan will never renegotiate, having got a very favorable deal in that case. True. So that the treaty has survived is also because India has allowed it to function. Uh, and that's very important, the upper IP of responsibility. And India has allowed it to function because there is no strategic advantage in disrupting the treaty. Mm -hmm. So let me get to that point. You said no strategic advantage. What you're saying is that uh, even if we suspend the treaty, or initiate moves here to abrogate or whatever, the it doesn't affect the quantum of flows, does it? I mean, uh, the, the water that is going to Pakistan will continue to flow. That's correct. Isn't that the case? Yes, that's correct, because uh, uh, the volume of the water has already been determined by the treaty, and it is done and dusted. Um, and therefore, I think there's no reason to believe that, uh, uh, you know, if India does... Um, uh, invite Pakistan to negotiate on the modification. Uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, 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 Pakistan will not come on the table. I do believe that given the situation now, Pakistan will want to discuss because there's no other option there. Uh, but to abrogate the treaty, I mean, there's no reason to believe there that uh, that will compel a good behavior from Pakistan, mm -hmm. especially when faced with the reality of uh, dealing with an assertive India as an upright period. So, so uh, there is no clear uh, link here that if India abrogates the treaty, you're going to get some good behavior from Pakistan. Um, abrogation again takes place uh, through very unilateral action and under yeah. very extraordinary uh, circumstances. And India will have to really define what the extraordinary situation is. Uh, it will define it to its public audience, but it has to also define it to the regional actors and also to the international community. And in the past, you've seen, uh, Surya, that there have been several incidents, for example, uh, the parliamentary attack in 2001, the Mumbai attack in 2008, Uri and uh, Palwama attacks in 2016 and 2019. Uh, they all did prompt India to abrogate the treaty, but yeah. it eventually did not. And I think the political leadership have been quite wary of such an action. Uh, and, I, and I think they, they sort of fall back to a more rational approach of living with the treaty, because India has invested a lot of political capital there. Uttam, the, the whole um, thing about upper, being an upper repairing uh, state, um, I mean, we've seen how China has behaved on the headwaters of the Indus, you know, on the Mekong, you know, a complete disregard of uh, uh, lower repairing states and how they could react if, uh, to the kind of uh, uh, dam building that Pakistan is doing, uh, you know, in the upper reaches. I mean, are we unduly sensitive about all this? A lack of confidence, no. perhaps? No, I don't think so. We are uh, unduly sensitive about our upper Iberian position. I think upper Iberian position is a position of responsibility, which we try to carry uh, with a great deal of uh, a sense and sensibility. But you have to, you know, in reality, you have to see what the cost of abrogation is. And certainly the cost of abrogation outweighs the gains. Uh, and that's have been well calculated. For example, abrogation may not go down well with India's image as uh, a responsible country in the neighborhood. Remember, we have several other treaties. Uh, yeah. with, for example, Nepal, with Bangladesh, we have a memorandum of understanding uh, water cooperation with Bhutan. So I think we have to calculate those uh, advantages that India has had in the neighborhood in terms of what relationship. So I think that cost-benefit analysis uh, needs to be done. Uh, let's not forget the fact that as India gets connected with world affairs, there certainly would be pressures from friendly countries for not honoring the treaty. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, you know, all that will add up to the fact that uh, at the end of the day, uh, when you abrogate the treaty, it's not going to really stop the flow of water to Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. True. So, and, and that is something that you know, hardliners or or those who are not very enthusiastic about this treaty or feel that uh, India has been far more generous to Pakistan. Uh, the fact is that uh, treaty or no treaty, um, the, the watershed 
and and the catchment area on Pakistan side is far more than India's side. So there will mm-hmm. always be water on Pakistan side, whether you abrogate the treaty or not. Mm-hmm. So assuming we Pakistan uh, agrees to renegotiate, uh, what do we ask for? We want more water. We'll demand that. I think there are two things, a couple of things that India should be doing. Uh, first, I think India should use the opportunity uh, to restart work on the Tulbul navigation project, which has mm-hmm. been in limbo since 1987. And that's a considerable period of time. I mean, a project like the Tulbul navigation, which, which can facilitate trade, tourism, which can give employment to the local population in Kashmir, I think that needs to be really uh, brought onto the table and should start uh, the process of, uh, you know, kick-starting the, the whole project. Uh, because, you know, the navigation is something that we miss on the Indus, uh, especially the 22 kilometer between the Sopur and the Baramula route, which will yeah. be very, very uh, important uh, for the local uh, population. You know, I've talked about abrogation not not going down well with India's image as a responsible pair. Uh, but I think also uh, India should focus on optimizing the treaty, especially on the Western rivers. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, we have not done so uh, in the last uh, six, decades, uh, six decades or so. But I think we are off late, particularly with this government, uh, investing a lot um, on those uh, projects on the Western rivers. And that is very important because these projects are part of the provisions of the Indus Notice Treaty, uh, and we have not really optimized that. So I think the stage for us at this moment, uh, in, in in near time and in the short time, would be to really build the projects which have been stipulated to us, build the storage capacities on the Western Rivers. Uh, 3.6 million acre feet is defined to us, and uh, we are nowhere near that. So we need this 10 to 12 year period to build our capacity on the Western Rivers. Uh, we also need to expand our irrigation facilities, which is again entitled under the Indus Waters Treaty. While simultaneously, I think we should continuously internationalize Pakistan behavior as a terror sponsoring state. You know. So it has to be a mix of, of things. Also, I think uh, our role also has a very important messaging in the region, which people tend to forget in terms of hard politics. Uh, being a upper responsible, riparian country, it is important for India uh, to be sensitive to the water concerns of the people of Pakistan. I think this distinction between the establishment of Pakistan and the people of Pakistan is a very important distinction and it carries a very broad, engaging message uh, to the countries and people in South Asia. So uh, there are ways to move forward uh, on the Indus Waters Treaty and not necessarily think about abrogation. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned that uh, we need to optimize uh, the uh, uh, Ravi Bihar Satlaj waters allocated to us. Yes. So, at the current stage, do you think uh, we are anywhere near that optimization? And what is the, is there a figure on optimization? How much of water, you know, ideally can be uh, stored, used, whatever? Well, yes, it is defined under uh, the treaty, the articles, especially the articles on the Western rivers in particular that there are certain non-consumptive usage, which is defined. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is, of course, domestic. Uh, that is, of course, industrial. Uh, but there are also uh, consumptions of water for irrigation and agriculture, and also consumption of water for hydroelectricity. Uh, over and above all this, there is also the storage capacity that India can undertake on the Western rivers. Uh, and that has been stipulated as 3.6 million acre feet, as I said. Uh, and that's a substantial amount um, uh, because that is the give and take that happened on the Western rivers. The Western rivers were allocated to Pakistan, just like the Eastern rivers were allocated to India. But on the Western rivers, India had the space to utilize some of those waters uh, in terms of uh, irrigation capacity, but also in terms of storage capacities. So when you do the calculation as of now, uh, we have not, in fact, a few years ago, we hadn't done any storage, not even 0.1. So mm-hmm. that has been our level of capacity building on the Western rivers. Uh, so over the last five to six years, uh, 
uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, enthusiasm as well as uh, proper study of how to build these projects um, on the Western rivers. And, and a lot of these projects have been kick-started. The government is investing heavily on the infrastructure development in Kashmir. And a lot of that infrastructure development is on the Western uh, rivers itself. So, uh, you know, there is that um, uh, looking into uh, the Western rivers and the entitlement of India on the Western rivers. But while we do so, I think there are, of course, uh, new knowledge, which is uh, for us to understand um, how to build these dams, because these are very sensitive terrains yeah. and difficult terrains. Uh, you know, you can't just blindly go and set up a project. It requires careful investigation um, and it has to be carefully determined. Also, I think uh, uh, the ecological factors, which was not thought about uh, when the treaty was signed or the climate change issues that have come about of late, which was not, you know, in those times in the 50s, uh, also needs to be factored in. So I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it presents a sort of a, a complex situation. Um, there is in no way any message from India, uh, or I don't believe that any government in India would ever think about abrogating the treaty. Mm. Uh, so the middle path, obviously, is to look at some modification, some, some updates on the treaty, which is required. After all, six decades have passed now new knowledge on water management, um, new knowledge on the hydrological settings, new engineering uh, ways and design, new technology has come up in, in water projects. So all these needs to be factored in to the treaty and that can be done only by modifying the treaty. So between optimizing the treaty and abrogating the treaty, uh, the middle path is to think about also uh, modifying, updating uh, the treaty resetting it in the more current knowledge scene uh, that is uh, quite noble to us now. Mm -hmm. Uttam, just to keep our, uh, for the information of our viewers, uh, for their background, these uh, six rivers mentioned in the Nidus Waters Treaty, do they originate in India? Where, where, where do they actually flow, flow from? So except for uh, the Indus and a tributary of the Sutlej, uh, all the other rivers originate in India. Uh, okay. The Indus originates from the Tibetan side, uh, you know, the autonomous region of China. And uh, uh, there's a couple of streams and tributaries of the Satlas that come from Tibet also. Uh, the rest is on India's side. So India is the upper riparian. So when the partition happened in 1947, the Indus Basin was one hydrological uh, uh, union. It, it, it reflected the unity. Uh, but when the partition happened, India got a new geography. Suddenly, India became the upper right area. Yeah. And Pakistan had to rely on its historical usage. And therefore, this conflict, uh, history, in a sense, versus geography came about. Uh, and two sovereign states uh, came on the Indus space. Never in the history of the Indus space, 3,500 3, years of Indus Basin history, never was uh, there two sovereign states. It was always mm -hmm. one hydrological uh, unity. So uh, two sovereign states uh, with a new set of uh, uh, configuration emerged and therefore um, uh, the Indus had to be willy-nilly uh, divided. Uh, I won't say it's a water sharing uh, treaty, it's, 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 it's a division of the basin. Uh, and because of the partition, because of the mistrust. I think the basin rationally was divided because that was the best way forward. Because you know, two countries who uh, were completely with trust deficit uh, couldn't work uh, in a sense of a hydrological unity. So you gave three rivers to Pakistan to handle, and you gave three rivers to India to handle, and that was the best way forward uh, with two countries who would never see eye to eye. So I think it was um, uh, practical, rational for the framers of the treaty to think in terms of dividing the basin. And, you know, in retrospect, one can argue many things, but given the, the, the reality of the situation, uh, 47 onwards, I think this was uh, the best way forward. And within the treaty, and I think it is useful for all international treaty to sort of learn from this treaty itself, is, is the dispute 
resolution, the difference dispute resolution mechanism, because that really balances the treaty, because it first acknowledges the fact that uh, water issues are highly political and there can be numerous disputes and contentions on water issues. Uh, it's about interpreting the treaty and your interpretation versus my interpretation is also a reality on water sharing. Yeah. So I think this mechanism was very carefully thought about. And I think it's this mechanism which has made the treaty live. And I think this is precisely what India is telling Pakistan, that you've violated, not the treaty per se, but you've violated this particular article of resolving mm -hmm. the differences. And I think this is a very uh, a forward looking approach that India has undertaken, mm -hmm. instead of saying, I will abrogate the truth. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that India has not optimized its share of the river waters, the eastern rivers. What about Pakistan? Have they done better? Well, uh, not really. Uh, and one of the reasons why Pakistan constantly raises the India bogey there is that it has failed miserably on its own uh, water management uh, uh, policies. Again, uh, within Pakistan, there is an upper riparian and lower riparian sentiments uh, between Sindh and Punjab in particular. Yeah. Remember, uh, the entire agricultural belt, food basket uh, were controlled by Punjab, right? And uh, they determined uh, the content and the extent of the water. So it was water for Punjabis first, um, and the agriculturalists and the industrialists first, and then the waters for the other lower provinces including Sindh, which is the lowest, most uh, riparian province. So there's a lot of um, uh, internal uh, sentiments and differences on water issues uh, in Pakistan. So it really helps the Pakistani uh, establishment to deflect the whole issue or towards India it. by labeling it as a water aggressor and a water hegemon and deliberately trying to run dry Pakistan or even flood Pakistan from time to time. So this narrative, uh, this uh, narrative of politicizing and securitizing water issues in, in Pakistan is a very concerted approach by uh, the Pakistan establishment. It's done very deliberately and very consciously. Uh, but I think it's going to fail now. Uh, and I think they need to get back uh, to the treaty, to the provisions of the treaty, uh, to Article 9, in particular in resolving uh, the differences and the disputes, if it may be. Uh, and, and that's the only way forward uh, for Pakistan. Because if India gets hard on renegotiating this treaty, then it will renegotiate on the Western rivers. And it will renegotiate hard on the Western rivers because it is the Western rivers now for India that really matters because it's Kashmir, it's about water development, it's about, it's about the aspirations of the people there. Uh, and the projects cannot be delayed any longer. Uh, and that's the tactical way that Pakistan uses the treaty by delaying uh, the whole water projects uh, in India by taking it to the court of arbitration. Uh, it delays the process, it increases the cost, and it creates a whole sort of embarrassment within the domestic constituency uh, in India. So last question, we have given uh, 90 days notice to Pakistan to respond. Uh, in the event they don't respond, I mean, I'm sure one hopes that they will. In the event they don't, oh, what do we do? I mean, it's very speculative, but... Uh, yes, speculative, 90 days is a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, I think um, um, India would hope that Pakistan uh, comes back to the negotiating table. Uh, and um, uh, it will do Pakistan good anyway. I think it would. Uh, I think there is also a lot of rhetoric involved um, in Pakistan's recent decisions. Um, also, I think uh, the World Bank has been uh, sort of shaken by this. Um, it takes the onus of the treaty, by the way, because it's been a third party to the process mm -hmm. uh, and it values the treaty very seriously. It never ventured into any other international basin after it. Yeah. Uh, venture itself in this space. <laughs> so it's emotionally involved. Uh, it has invested uh, heavily there. Um, and therefore, it does want to be seen as an honest third party actor. Mm -hmm. And I would believe that uh, the World Bank would nudge and push Pakistan uh, 
to come to the table and uh, you know work through a very uh, you know uh, a cooperative mechanism of indus commissioners who sit and discuss uh, in a transparent way and, and try to resolve the differences in a bilateral format and i think that's what india would really want it wants the indus uh, issues or the indus water issues to be within the bilateral format um, and um, that's the best way forward uh, for the treaty Uttam, thanks very much. Uh, a lot of clarity there and insight. And uh, let's see, uh, 90 days will tick away like that. So um, uh, hopefully yeah. there will be some reaction well, and some good sense in Islamabad. Well, yeah, yeah. But one thing would be if, if 90 days passes, then I think India has one option of suspending the treaty. Uh, uh -huh. If Pakistan does not come to the table. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope our friends across the border are listening in. And uh, <laughs> they really need to get their heads together on this. Yeah, I think the treaty should live. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It should live. One would argue that it has outlived its utility to some extent, yeah. but it still has space to work, uh, to get modified, to have new knowledge into it, and, and, and most of the whole content of the treaty. Uh, that's the whole idea, I think, of the treaty, that it needs to readjust to the realities of the time as well. Yeah. Uttam, thank you very much. A great pleasure thank talking you, to you. Pleasure. And for those of you who joined us on this conversation, uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on social media, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you and good night.